sharp distinction between concentration practice and insight practice. But they really have to go together. And concentration doesn't automatically give rise to insight. Insight doesn't automatically give rise to concentration. But for them to develop, they need to work together. Some people find that one develops more naturally than the other. But the ideal is that you get them in balance. Now, balance doesn't mean totally static combination all the way down. Sometimes you're going to lean a little bit more to the left. Sometimes you're going to lean a little bit more to the right. But as they work together, you find that the two help each other along. In other words, it takes a certain amount of insight for you to get the mind to get concentrated. You have to understand okay, what kind of thoughts are going to get in the way, what ways you have of dealing with them, what tools you can bring. So that you can prepare it when the mind doesn't settle down easily. Various tactics for fending off distraction. And for finding something the mind likes. We are talking earlier today about the carrot and the stick. The carrot is a nice, comfortable sense of feeling you can develop with the breath. And if you work with it, if you explore it, you find the breath can be really, really comfortable. Sometimes it gets so good you can just get absorbed in the breathing. And you can't imagine why you would need anything else to make yourself happy, because it just feels so good. That's the carrot. The problem is the mind doesn't always settle down in a very nice and cooperative way. And so you need the stick. In other words, remembering that there are problems out there and that you're going to need to keep your tools at hand. There's a list of five ways of dealing with distracting thoughts, but it's a shorthand for a whole variety of things. Sometimes you just replace the distracting thought, just bring the mind back to the breath. Give it something better to think about than that thought and try to make the breath as comfortable as possible. Sometimes you have to sit and reason with yourself. In other words, if something is really sticky, something that keeps holding on, you've got to point out the drawbacks of that particular kind of thinking. Until the mind is ready to let it go, say, well, I don't really want to go there, drops it and goes, goes back to the breath. Sometimes you consciously ignore that thought. In other words, you know it's there, you're just not going to pay any attention. It's like something in the in the background. You keep the breath up to the foreground and just make sure you just don't get involved in that other thought. You know it's there. Then you just let it go. Don't pay attention, because by paying attention to it, you're feeding it. So you focus all your attention on the breath. Another way of dealing with distraction is once you get really sensitive to how the, the breath energy flows in the different parts of the body, you see that a particular thought is going to be associated with a pattern of tension someplace in the body. It might be around the eyes, in the arms, any part of the body. When you can locate the pen tension that goes along with the thought, you relax it, and the thought will go away. Another way to deal with thoughts when none of these four methods react or re give responses give results. You just to consciously even press your tongue against the roof of your mouth and just sort of squeeze the thought out. I'm not going to think about anything else, just going to force things out. If we were to compare this to a toolbox, that's the sledgehammer in the toolbox. And it works as long as your willpower holds out. And sometimes that's all you need, it's just a little breathing space or a little calm space in the mind. Not necessarily calm, but it's not distracted. And then you can relax, let up a little bit, and then go back to the breath. And maybe by that time one of the other methods will kick in and help you along. So you've got to be alert to the fact that even when the mind is beginning to settle down, something else can come in. So part of you is settling down and another part is keeping watch. And once you find that the settled part really is settled, then that watchful, wary state can be 
relaxed a little bit, you can focus more and more attention on the breath itself. Allow the mind to enter into the breath as fully as possible. As long as you're alert and mindful, there's no such thing as too much concentration, too much stillness. That's when the stillness blots out the mindfulness and alertness. That's when you've got to be careful. But as long as you're very clear about where you are, where you're focused, you allow the mind just to burrow on into the breath, burrow on into the present moment. Letting go of anything that might smack of either just the moment past or the next moment coming up. Just totally give yourself to the present moment. Allow the mind to rest in that way, to gain strength in that way, so that when it comes out, it's ready to, for work. The work here is the insight. And again, sometimes the coming out is total. You come back to ordinary consciousness, and other times it's not. You step back a little bit. Not so far that you've destroyed the concentration, but far enough so that you can see what's going on. And then you just watch. Pose a question in the mind. The best questions have to do with the Four Noble Truths. Where is there any stress or suffering right here? Although there are other ones as well. Say, you sense that there's greed, anger, delusion, any of these things are kind of lurking around in the mind. The Buddha says, if you really want to understand them, the point of getting past them, you have to understand not only their drawbacks, but also their allure. Why is it that that particular state of mind is so attractive? Why are you willing to play along with it? It was mentioned earlier, there is that point in the mind where one of these little worlds of becoming suddenly appears in the mind. And you have the choice to go with it or not. To go along with it, it's like playing make-believe. Why are we willing to play make-believe in that way? What pulls us in? Boredom? What's the gratification that comes from these things? You have to look for that as well. And when you see that there's really not much, and when you put things in the scales, weigh the gratification against the drawbacks, you'll find that the drawbacks are always a lot greater. But if you pretend that there's no allure at all, after a while the mind will begin to realize it's lying to itself, and then it revolts. So you've got to be fair. Okay, there is allure, but there's also drawbacks, which is greater. Be honest with yourself. This is why the Buddha has his focus on the question of stress. Because of stress, even in, even in states of concentration, there's one level of stress. But first you want to focus on the grosser forms. This is how insight develops. You start working on the things that are really obvious. But it's amazing how we're not willing to focus on the things that are really obvious. People want to skip on to the more advanced levels. I was reading recently about a conference they're going to be giving in the New York next month. And they're going to have a discussion panel on renunciation. Now, are they going to be discussing renouncing, renouncing sensual pleasures? No, they're going to be, talk about ego renunciation. They're going to jump over the obvious and go for the subtle. And of course, what happens is the obvious stuff never gets dealt with. <coughs> and the subtle stuff doesn't really have that much of an effect. You focus on the obvious things first. The greed, the lust, the anger. The fear. Work with those. Even 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 though you may not be able to uproot them, at least you can start chipping them down to size. Bit by bit by bit. Because if you don't practice, if you don't exercise your discernment in this way, how is it going to get strong? It's like a muscle. If you don't. Your muscle may be weak. How do you make it strong? Well, you use the weak muscle you've got. In the beginning, it may not be able to pick up a lot of stuff. You get kind of discouraged, but you realize that as you keep lifting slightly heavier and slightly heavier and slightly heavier things, it builds up, gets stronger and stronger. It's the same with your discernment. You start out with the blatant stuff. Deal with that, and then start working into the more and more subtle stuff as your discernment gets more precise and clearer. Now, sometimes you find as you're working on these questions about where is the stress here? What else is going on in the mind that's creating the stress? Sometimes you find as you 
follow these questions along, things get clear. You begin to understand things. Other times, though, the mind isn't up to that question, line of questioning yet. Things start getting confused. When that happens, you pull back into concentration. The comparison, comparison that John Lee makes is with walking. You lean a little bit to the left on the left foot, then you lean a little bit to the right on the right foot. And it's by switch, shifting your weight from left to right, left to right, left to right, you walk along. And so it is in meditation. We're practicing the one object here with the breath. But sometimes you lean a little bit more towards just really getting absorbed in just the stillness of the mind with the breath. And other times you lean a little bit more to the questioning. The ideal practice is when neither side is too far from the other. In other words, the questioning stays in the present moment, doesn't leave the present moment. And at the same time, your concentration doesn't lose its mindfulness and alertness and go off into a dead blank. As the two help each other along, as the Buddha said, that those who have both discernment and jhana, those are the ones who are in the presence of awakening. So it's a question of gaining your own intuitive sense of when the mind needs some rest and when it needs to ask questions. And also get an intuitive sense of which questions are getting results and which ones are not. If their questions are related to the Four Noble Truths, okay, you're on the right track. Where is the stress here? Sometimes you sit in very quiet for a long time and you don't see any stress at all. It's a sign maybe you're not sensitive enough. So you try to make things more quiet. It's like tuning in on a radio station. If there's static, you can't hear the signal clearly, so you try to tune more and more and more precisely onto the wavelength. To find that there's no static at all, then it's very clear. So the more stillness in the mind, then it, the easier it is to notice movement, to notice stress, to notice disturbance when it happens. You've got a standard against which to measure things. So as we're focusing in on the breath, we're developing both tranquility and insight. The two help each other along. And the skill comes in the meditation, getting that intuitive sense I talked about just now. And when it's when you need more rest, when you need to ask questions, when the questioning has hit a dead end, it's time to go back for some more rest. When the stillness of the mind is the mind has had enough, it's getting a sense of these things. And that kind of stuff can't be measured. So that one person can tell another person, okay, now is the time to stop, now that now is the time to go on to something else. You have to use your own powers of observation so that you can learn how to walk properly. If you don't tip over to the left, don't tip over to the right. Or turn around and walk back. It's like gaining a sense of balance. Nobody else can gain your balance for you. You've got to learn how to govern your own mind. 